These days, you can find a different game every two steps and an interesting one every five. So how can you distinguish your product in a busy market? Sakuna of Rice and Ruin takes explicit inspiration from ActRaiser and Terranigma, games that are never mentioned nowadays, which is already reason enough to give Edelweiss's game some attention and delay your never-ending backlog even further. Upon starting your first action platforming session, Sukuna's movements appear fussier than the bratty attitude she cops in the introduction. You can try every combination of buttons imaginable to speed up, run, or change pace, but she'll move in the only gear she has. Attempting a double jump will also fail on you since this isn't an option either. To extend your range, the tool at your disposal is the Divine Raiment. Quite fashionable in the way the goddess wears it, it loses its appeal when you discover it won't get you to that cliff over there due to its limited directionality. There are only eight directions available. When you die, your position, time, and progress get reset to the beginning. And while another try in the platforming section might not be that big deal for a patient player, you won't appreciate having to restart because you don't play nice with some of the controls. Even still, this esteemed adornment is an item you're gonna rely on, not only for acrobatics, but for fighting. Using the Heavenly Scarf, Sukuna can turn an enemy into a pivot and swing around it to the other side. This evasive routine is fundamental as it lets you hit your target from behind while giving you an invincibility status. But don't get complacent. With the scarf's fixed range, it's a strategy that might land you in traps if you don't think twice. And it isn't just about being unable to aim at a specific demon in a chaotic situation. Traps help prevent the game from becoming a cheap button masher. That said, the developers are more than happy to let you use them against the weak AI. You just have to make collision and terrain damage work for you. It doesn't take Sun Tzu to discover you can trick a charging bore into crashing, but it does require skill due to the control's lack of polish and some superficial elements you wouldn't expect from simply watching recorded gameplay. At times, enemies will be grounded, but you won't be able to hit them or inflict any damage. Combine this with the Divine Raiment's partial limitations and the fact that flying monsters are difficult to aim at, and you start to assemble a collection of asterisks across numerous mechanics. Not being as smooth as Dante is no fault. Just look at Tombi's controls. But with the lack of personality and contribution from each stage you encounter, the desire to keep on platforming with Sakuna is absent. Evading is not the only option to avoid damage. Parry is performed by pushing Sakuna close to the enemy with the correct timing. You'll need some precision since the window is not exactly forgiving, but when properly executed, this sassy little goddess holds her own against her enemy like a boss. If this isn't rewarding, I don't know what is. Although, if you're suddenly thinking of making Parry your signature move, the game will have the last laugh, proving you gullible for mistaking it as difficult. The game's AI is not in the running for any kind of merit. Indeed, it's self-evident how hard it is for opponents to deal with different terrains, heights, and even bumps. Considering how levels evolve by the end of the game, it's even more apparent that demons are not designed for certain environments when they automatically saunter into lava and die. The way the game ups its difficulty is by throwing as many opponents at you as possible. And on top of this conspicuously cheap design tactic, the demons are recycled throughout the game, devaluing the experience of playing it in a manner it doesn't deserve. Granted, cycle is a fundamental word in many of Sakuna's conceptual and design elements, but unfortunately, the concept of recycling generates a bad feeling, especially toward the end when the game tries to stretch itself many hours beyond what is necessary or desired. Here comes the part where you discover the game's platforming element is more exploratory, deviating from the traditional format where you constantly move forward and leave enemies behind. To progress the story and unlock new locations, you have to reach a specific exploration level mark. Finding the exit as your objective means, well, finding the exit. That's all it says. 
you don't have to kill everybody on the way there, even if that feels implied. When allowed, you can skip everyone. The game's objectives include tasks that don't contribute anything to your pleasure. Mainly, you have to find some specific items. But while it sounds easy, considering you may not have to fight anything, obtaining certain kinds of ore means relying on the game's RNG to generate it. If at first you don't succeed, you have to wait an undefined period of time before returning to give it the chance to regenerate. It's nothing more than a time-wasting roulette that you can outsmart by saving and reloading should you not get what you need. Speaking of time and objectives, the game has a day-night cycle that forces you to plan your incursions and retreat at dusk, as nighttime requires you to have a much higher character level. But that's the main constraint in a system that doesn't really give you any sense of urgency. It's not engaging when asked to collect X many pieces of amber or perform a specific number of skills to jump in and out of the same stage over and over just to meet your objective. That said, if you feel weak in the main path as it incrementally unfolds, this gives you the chance to gain more experience. And here comes the twist in Sakuna. You don't improve your character with fighting. As previously said, this portion of the game is an exploration phase with item drops for weapon crafting and rice farming. The farming part of the game is literally that, farming. The day-night cycle means there are three phases composing not a week, not a month, but a whole season. Cultivation begins just before the arrival of spring. To get started, you remove all the stones and till the terrain. Then, you add fertilizer to the field. Now, I happen to be an expert on the subject, since I grew a tomato this one time. And it's clunky how Sakuna is unable to walk straight while going about her farming operations. Even seeding requires the same concentration as a boss battle. But it's intended to keep your attention. It's no coincidence they call it the art of ricing. Following Taoimon's hints, you get used to filling the field with enough water to cover your ankles, and by summer, you alternate almost full water with draining sessions. Harvesting takes place in autumn. The rice has to dry before winter, and then you can proceed with threshing and hulling. Each phase requires a decent amount of patience in your first attempts, and it takes a while for the game to fully unfold. The grind factor really shows off here. The more you till, the sooner you gain a skill that lets you perform the operation faster. The more you shred, the faster you can shred next time. The feeling that too many things are designed to be unlocked through repetition like a cookie game and must be unlocked to be fun is regrettably predominant. It's essential to remember that Taoimon's suggestions are generic. There are scrolls and information scattered around many places. Though, on a less positive note, they are poorly implemented and organized. The game partly relies on experimentation and obscurity. What should be more obscure, to the point of completely disappearing, is the text frame on the left, which usually displays your objectives. On many occasions, it stays on the screen when you don't want it to, even occasionally getting stuck at the beginning of a cutscene. The quality of your harvest defines how many levels your character gains, and each property correlates to one of Sakuna's attributes. So, when factoring in fertilizer's components, you can plan the outcome based on your preferences. This being an item-based decision, you can see how exploration and item research impacts this part of the game. Yield is associated with HP, and more rice also means a greater capacity for trading. Aroma is the property to focus on if you want to improve magic and access better combat skills. You can focus your breeding by opting for brown rice instead of white. Although, according to some basic information offered in-game, you shouldn't, in theory, need brown rice since it just gives you temporary stat boosts. This makes growing 100% white rice, which permanently raises Sakuna's attributes, seem like the natural choice. But it's clear that the farming system is even more elaborate, with countless variables involved in the manipulation of crops. It's definitely the best part of Sukuna, and the game allows you to dedicate yourself to it, giving you rivers and forests full of ingredients to research and collect. 
these perishable items, which must be processed to avoid wastage, are necessary to implement recipes and join in communal dinners. On that note, making food is another mechanic that shouldn't be underestimated. That's because some meals feature bonuses like health regeneration. Other status bonuses like poison resistance are almost a must in certain dungeons. The more you try to talk about the game, the more you end up sounding like a farm-to-table cooking show. Wait, is this still a game review? Having to go out and slash animals makes the combat section and the whole story feel uninteresting and out of place, especially considering how milked it is for fear of not providing content or a decent challenge. But for people in search of a patient, hybrid adventure, it might be worth staying the course for the endgame content and special dungeon. Meanwhile, those in love with the harvesting side may still desire something more dedicated, readily available in the traditional waifu-less farming simulator. If you've ever questioned the standard video game ranking system, the typical 1 to 10 scale, Sukuna of Rice and Ruin, is a classic example that might explain the limitations and uselessness of it. You will fall in love with Sukuna. You will say it's a good game, even if objectively there are many things that are quite underwhelming and can easily be improved upon in a sequel. You will find contradictions when you compare it to other games with the same rating. But at the same time, you can't reduce it to a mediocre experience. It's definitely not. You shouldn't, and you can't, ignore the legend of Edelweiss being a three-man studio that made all of this. It's extremely easy to point out the weaknesses of a game that has been produced by a doujin studio to talk about how much better this game could be. Ether Vapor and Asta Breed, especially, deserve your attention, and Sukuna is clearly an evolution of Fairy Bloom Freesia. Quality voiceovers and beautiful art help to compensate a lack of production and absolutely cover the game's shortcomings. Sukuna belongs to a niche genre that doesn't deserve to be niche. It might not be the air of reciterre as one might have expected, the combat section doesn't play as well as it seems on video, and it's not the brave fencer Musashi you are hoping for, but it's a great introduction to an adorable main character that you will want to revisit or even see featured in a more acclaimed video game like Smash Bros.